Cardano Show with your host Satori D. Uh, today we have a really special crypto hustle update and we have a special guest here today, Dr. Charles Evan, Associate Professor of Economics Finance at Barry University, Miami, Florida, and also the founding director of Conscious Entrepreneurship Foundation. How are you, Dr. Charles? Uh, doing very well, thank you. So. Before the, we started the show, we were just kind of discussing, and I think this is kind of a really interesting um, part, is that in about how Texas has kind of like a blanket statement that if you do, you, you propose your business and you're using Bitcoin, that it will kind of um, just have this agreement that it will get most likely um, passed or, or, or really accepted that, you know, it's kind of formality. But uh, in Florida, you were saying that they're um, still um, up in the air about this? Yeah, okay. So the regulators, uh, the financial regulators in Kansas, Tennessee, and Texas have looked at their existing statutes and they said, okay, if you're buying and selling Bitcoin for your own inventory, that's not money transmittal. And so you don't need to register as a money transmitter for that activity in this state. Other states have been silent. Some other states have said, no, if you touch Bitcoin or if you even have a baseball cap with a B on the front, then you need to have a money transmitter license. But Texas, Tennessee and Kansas, within their existing statutes, the regulators have said, if you're buying and selling your own inventory, in other words, it's it's you and me, one of us is buying Bitcoins, the other one's selling, then that's not money transmittal and that's not regulated. So when that came out from Texas in April of 2014, I contacted the Florida state regulators, uh, the, the, the financial regulators, and I asked what Florida's position was on that. And they said, we'll get back to you. So it's been a little bit more than two years. I started to get really frustrated. And through a chance meeting with somebody here in Miami, who runs an organization that promotes small scale business in Nigeria. He became very interested in Bitcoin, wanted to know more about it. I explained to him some of the difficulties of setting up a remittance network in Florida because the Florida regulators have been silent. And then he sits up straight in his chair and he says, well, would you be willing to tell this to Jeb Bush? And I said, uh, uh, yeah, I, I guess. And uh, before I knew it, within a week, I was in Jeb Bush's private office in Coral Gables, going on and on for 45 minutes about my frustrations. Apparently, uh, word got out from him, and I was able to get meetings that I wasn't able to get before. And finally, I had a conference call with the Florida State financial regulators. And the answer that I got from them was that the position in Texas seems to be about right. They don't seem to have a problem with that. But the way that the statutes are written in this state and the way the regulations work in this state, they're not in a position to issue the same kind of blanket statement that the Texans did. It's, it, it's because of the way the statutes are written. But if you or I send them a letter and say, I want to do this, this and this, they will issue a ruling. And they said, in all likelihood, the ruling would be very similar to what you see in Texas, but we would have to see your letter. We would have to see your proposal and we cannot issue a blanket statement. So this is more just conversation than official position. And I took away from that. Okay, good. So at least it's not that bad down here. But I was frustrated that the unfortunate situation is that you need to be very... The, the industries that they're accustomed to dealing with are highly concentrated. So here in Florida, if you're with commercial real estate, if you're in the hospitality industry, if you're in, in, in uh, uh, tourism, uh, the cruise industry, uh, logistics, these are huge industries here, then the regulators are accustomed to dealing with that. They're not accustomed to dealing with this kind of Silicon Valley sort of you know, herd of 10,000 cats kind of thing. They, they, that's just not what they do. And so we have a little bit of frustration with that down here. And that's something that I'm pretty vocal about because it's very irritating to be living in the third most populous state in the United States. And it's very frustrating to be living closer to dozens of foreign capitals than I live to Washington, D.C. 
and to feel like I have a 50 pound bag of sand on my back before I can even walk out my front door. And so these are sort of, these, these are the sorts of things that we're dealing with right now. Yeah. And this is where I find the, the conversation and really when I started digging into you, really interesting. And um, you're also the founding director of the Conscious Entrepreneur Foundation. And um, from what I gathered, uh, it's you're doing a lot of work um, or or the part of this foundation is, and I liked when we had this conversation, you used the emerging middle um, class and kind of that if we say here in the States, get more on board and, and take the roadblocks out of it, um, that it's a really good opportunity to say what you're saying about this foreign capital, like Venezuela, their, their money is getting so devalued that I, I kind of see that more more adoption of Bitcoin or, or something similar. So so they could start, you know, because um, I was talking to my other friend and he was saying that you, you find this when people d don't have uh, trust in the financial system that Bitcoin and the blockchain is kind of a, a really good answer. And you can see this adoption happening rapidly. And we were talking about the alternative energy they 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 have a blanket uh, blank slate over there and with these technologies being low cost and more and more ready available that you're going to see adoption and it's going to be rapid growth over there so um i kind of want to see what your foundation is doing and what you see as far as the possibilities of, of bitcoin being adopted yeah i mean this this th this goes along a continuum uh that Getting back to the point that you were making a moment ago, yeah, when I was a child growing up in Miami, you know, Me Mexico was run by, you know, an author authoritarian government. A lot of the countries in Latin America were military governments. It wasn't until about 1980 or so that every country in Latin America had a democratically elected government except for Cuba. Uh, prior to that, there were military dictatorships, there were coups, there were, it was just a big mess. And over time, things have progressively become better and better to the point now where you're seeing people like Eric Voorhees leaving the United States to go live in Panama, which is amazing because, you know, it was only a couple decades ago that Manuel Noriega was running the, was running Panama like a strongman. And so to call that the third world just doesn't really fit anymore. And even referring to these countries as the developing world doesn't work the way that it used to, because you see in places like sub-Saharan Africa, where people have leapfrogged from not having telephones to having mobile phones. And so they've gone from unwired to wireless. And with Bitcoin, we're starting to see a growing community of these people going from being unbanked to being bank free. And when the solar technology and the wind technology becomes more efficient, then you know you could even see people producing electricity there locally and things along these lines. We're seeing this in many different technologies. So it is not cost effective for me to put solar panels on my house here in Fort Lauderdale, oddly enough. And strangely enough, given the amount of rain that we have, it also makes no sense for me to put rain barrels out there because the city water is cheaper. And if you live in that kind of environment, it's easy to forget that only about 120 miles away from me over in the Bahamas, electricity is about four times as expensive as it is for me. So even in a middle income country like the Bahamas, it, it becomes worthwhile to start exploring some of these other technologies. And so then getting back to the work that we do with Conscious Entrepreneurship Foundation, we advise people who are in these, what I refer to as emerging middle income regions, which also includes about 20% of the people in the United States, by the way, who are not very well served by the banking system, which is why we have the payday loans. And that's why you can pay your phone bill at some gas stations and things along those lines. Uh, because there are a lot of people here who are not served by the banking system. And um, just, you know, by way of, you know, one little anecdote here, I was invited to be on a panel with a with one of the officials from the Atlanta Federal Reserve 
and a, uh, a lawyer down here who deals in high profile financial crimes on, on Bitcoin. So it was this Latin American bankers conference. There are thousands of people coming from all over the Western hemisphere and I'm up on stage there. And um, so then it was my turn to speak. And I told them the story about a conference that I'd been at the week prior. And that was one where somebody asked at that conference, what is it that Bitcoin can do that the banks cannot do? And, you know, we paused very dramatically and kind of looked around the room, inhaled and then said, open accounts, because that's one thing that, that Bitcoin can do that the banks just seem not able to do worldwide. And people don't realize this, but the majority of adults in the world don't have bank accounts. And if you throw in their children, that means that something like 75 to 80 percent of the world's population does not have access to a functioning bank account, which is why we have Western Union and MoneyGram and Hawalas and all that kind of stuff. So I'm working with folks in Africa, mainly in Ghana, Sierra Leone, and a little bit in Nigeria. And working with them to get spun up on using Bitcoin. We have one really great success story in Ghana. The young man has started something called the Dream Bitcoin Foundation, where he organizes Bitcoin conferences to promote the use of Bitcoin uh, among people there in Western Africa. And uh, he'll get two or 300 people showing up sometimes. And then he also started a remittance service called BTC Ghana. And um, he's promoting that by word of mouth. It's kind of a friends and family thing where people in London who are sending money to Ghana will buy Bitcoins. They send the Bitcoins to him. He then will transfer telephone minutes to the ultimate recipient in Ghana. And then he will find somebody who wants to buy the Bitcoins. In Ghana, it's very easy to sell Bitcoins. So now that he sold the Bitcoins, he has Ghanaian Sedi, that's the national currency there. He uses the Ghanaian money to buy telephone minutes, and then he gets Bitcoins from London. He transfers telephone minutes to the ultimate recipient, sells the Bitcoins, buys telephone minutes, and around and around and around it goes. And he's undercutting Western Union. And he's, um, he's already turned some revenue, so he's crossed the penny gap. And now he's out there beating the bushes, looking for uh, somebody who's willing to invest in his project so that he can get together a marketing budget to build this thing up. We have another lady in Botswana who is working predominantly with uh, female entrepreneurs in Botswana to teach them to be independent and to stand on their own feet. And she's also very active with Bitcoin. In fact, some of your listeners might even know of her. Her name is uh, Ala Itiriling. Uh, I might have the uh, pronunciation of that wrong, but this is the Bitcoin lady down in, in Botswana. And we're in touch from time to time. We've got a couple people who are in the early stages of figuring out what they want to do in Sierra Leone who show great promise. And every time I communicate with these people, I think if we could just do this five and a half billion more times, we could end poverty by next Monday. Yeah. And, and this is the what, what I find the most intriguing about the whole blockchain um, technology and Bitcoin, that it's a blanket slate and it's an even playing field. And that, and it's kind of uh, goes to that old saying that um, necessity is the mother of, of, um, of all inventions, that, that it takes kind of this like pressure. Um, it seems like it, it takes this, this, it has that pressure of necessity, you say like in the emerging um, middle class, that they they get up they they have you know they come up with great um solutions to to said problems and they just need something some underlining financial system to help um uh, fund this to help get the wheels going for this and but um i think too uh, why i'm going to follow up um on some of um already give these contacts and keep up with with what you're doing with the Conscious Entrepreneur found, uh, Foundation because I find it really fascinating and it's really something that maybe we should uh, try to highlight more because um, as far as I know there's not that much people covering I said, uh, said um, such things because for whatever reason um, 
but I think it would really help facilitate bringing that forward of of saying you know having what what, what you're doing with your foundation, but what what they're doing in the merge and even s- simply as rephrasing certain words could can go a long ways. It helps uh, reframe your mind, but also kind of gives them the respect that that uh, they want. And prior to the show, you were saying it's like telling an 18 year old that he's he's still a child and then uh going further with that analogy is like that's the problem with communication said with said adults to someone that's younger right you you treat them like they're still a kid or or a child and then they don't want to hear what you have to say and that it it, things run smoothly as far as communication when you kind of give them the benefit uh especially if they show it that you know that they really want to to learn or whatever and it could really help um push development forward and this is something that uh personally i i find um close to my heart um i kind of i I grew up here in in los angeles and and you how you were saying the emerging middle class is not just out there uh, outside our borders it's here I, i grew up in east la and i know plenty of people that don't have bank accounts and and they use the the payday loans and they cash their checks at different places and if you really dig into it they're very predatory and i and they just use it out of necessity but if you could uh, somehow uh do it where it's more of an even playing field and it's not as predatory um i think it would benefit everybody as a whole oh yeah absolutely i mean that that's the one one of the things is you know we, we you know people talk about the developing world and no, not at all. I mean, if you just go, th- <laughs> have, heaven help you, your car, you know, has trouble and you have to actually get off the 101 and you, you wind up three blocks away. You know, you're, you're, you're right there in the middle of it. Um, and, 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 you know, we're, we're talking about areas here in Miami, for example, where if you look at the, 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 the Census Bureau data broken down by, by neighborhood, we have this, this hole right in the middle of um, South Florida, between Fort Lauderdale and Miami, there's there's this there's this area that looks like the you know it's it's like the economic land that time forgot. This is the area where Trayvon Martin grew up, and within bicycling distance, you can see boats that are worth more than the gross domestic products of some small countries. It's just it's just tragic that 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 we have this this situation, and a lot of it in the United States is driven by the um, uh, the the way the justice system works. Because in the United States, if you've ever touched the judicial system uh, as as a defendant, it it changes your life profoundly. Uh, if you have a police record, then chances of your being called back for a job interview fall by like fifty percent. And in this world where people are being replaced by automation left and right, that can be devastating. And then on top of that, heaven help you if you actually went to jail. There are a lot of housing complexes, you know, apartment buildings and, and, and condo associations will not let you rent there. And so you can't get a job. You can't rent an apartment or a house in a decent neighborhood. But oddly enough, the secretary of state of the state that you live in is more than happy to have you incorporate a business. And so this is what initially drove the creation of Conscious Entrepreneurship Foundation was the recognition that something like 25% or maybe even the number is higher, I don't know, but but anyway, it, an unacceptably large proportion of African Americans are, are basically excluded from mainstream society. And that that just can't stand. And so we said, all right, why don't we start an organization that promotes entrepreneurship because anyone can start a business. We set up a website and then before I knew it, I had, it it felt like half of Africa showed up on my front doorstep. I have no idea how that happened, but these guys came and they, they, they just wanted, they wanted contacts and they, they were of a single mind that they are as disgusted by the Nigerian Prince stereotype as anybody else. And, and, and it's just remarkable what I've seen in the past couple of years. Uh, and in fact, for your listeners, if, if you go to a website called Gapminder, that's G-A-P as in Peter, and then Minder, M-I-N-D as in David, E-R dot org. It's run by 
a Swedish public health professor named Hans Rosling. Uh, he's, he's also produced TED videos and, and some other presentations, but watch his stuff about how the longevity and how the per capita income has changed country by country around the world in the past century. And it's just dramatic that there's about five to five and a half billion humans on this rock who are making a really good hard run for the middle class. And it's going to be really interesting to see what comes of all that in the next, you know, 10 years or so. There's already a car company in Ghana where they, th no, this isn't a subsidiary of a Western company. This is a Ghanaian car company. They build these really rugged cars for the really bad roads in Ghana. And as you said, necessity is the mother of invention, which we've already seen a lot of in India. And um, so I'm just glad to be a small part of this. And, and to just watch some of these people, you know, develop from not being sure where they want to start to getting a few introductions through me to sometimes I want to send them my resume because they're doing just amazing things, these people. Yeah. And I, I think um, I'm glad I reached out to you and you accepted uh, my invitation. And this has been really a, a great um, discussion. And I hope. Well, Later, you're the first journalist to reach out to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, I want to uh, kind of continue this on uh, later on as things develop. Um, so I'll keep in touch with you. And I really like uh, what I've seen with the Conscious Entrepreneur uh, Foundation. And um, so because I think we have a lot to learn from each other of what what they're doing. Like what you said, you'd be impressed that you want to send them your resume. Like, oh, man, I want to be a part of what you're doing over there. And... Uh, I think that that's we have a lot to learn from everybody. Yeah, I, actually, I, I said that half jokingly, but <laughs> you know, if if somebody listening to this were thinking that you either want to take some time off from school, or maybe the startup that you were working on, uh, you know, maybe it folded and you're between gigs or something like that, um, you know, there there the, these these guys will probably be able to help you find a place to sleep and find some food. And it might be fun to spend a few months or a year or whatever on the ground, just being a part of that. Uh, if anyone, you know, is, is up for that kind of adventure, young people or, you know, somebody who's middle-aged who, who, you know, whatever. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's amazing what people are doing out there. And if, anyone wanted to go out there and actually be a part of it, I expect that it would be relatively easy for us to get you in touch with somebody who would introduce you around and, you know, basically get you started. And by being there on the ground, you can only imagine what sorts of things that you know that you take for granted would be of particular value to somebody somewhere else. So it's just something to keep in mind. I mean, the world could be your university. Yeah. And I, I like, uh, the world will be your university but um so we'll leave it right there and i'll put up the links to to uh, want to uh wrap up a any more sentiments that you want to communicate out there any more projects or anything else that's that's pretty much it uh usually <laughs> depending upon the audience this is when i start doing my plug for south florida because we um we don't have a state income tax and housing is relatively affordable here we also have a majority female population and we also have uh, better connectivity in Miami than they do in Silicon Valley or Austin because we have a huge internet landing point here but aside from that uh, I, 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 th I think I've pretty much covered the high points so yeah I, I really appreciate I really appreciate the invitation yeah I really i um, glad that you came on um, so for everybody listening um Get, if you find this interesting, uh, contact me. We'll put up links to his to his website, to Mind the Gap, and um, as always, thank you. But uh, get involved. Uh, just jump in there. It's, I mean, everything's kind of up for grabs, and take a hold.